Very good. Well, it's nice to have you here. I don't know if you remember me, but I study the cosmic microwave background radiation. And today we're going to talk a lot about the early history of cosmology, in particular, Giant's work and his books. I have two of his books here, which I referenced in my book, Losing the Nobel Prize. This one, Current Issues in Cosmology, and this one, uh, Facts and Speculations in Cosmology. And the first thing I want to begin with is if Giant, if you can explain how you got, how you first met Jeffrey Burbage, my late colleague at UC San Diego. How did you first meet Jeff Burbage? How you met Jeffrey Burbage? Oh, what happened was uh, I had been a student of Fred Hoyle uh, in Cambridge. And uh, I used to hear about him from Fred. And then one, one day uh, he turned up in Cambridge, he, both he and Margaret. And there was a great deal of excitement uh, as if some heroes have come, you know, so the names, the name had preceded them. So a number of us students were waiting to talk to them. And he came and then we had a, a informal talk and then he disappeared. Then I saw him only when I went to San Diego. Mm. That was a little later. And how did you meet Fred Hoyle? Oh, how did I meet Fred Hoyle? Yes. He was your advisor? And, uh, after I finished my uh, what they call the tripos examination, which is the final degree examination before entering as a research student. Then uh, I did fairly well. So I, I was given the first choice of to whom I could go. And, so <laughs> for first preference. <laughs> so I went to Fred mm. and Fred was uh, uh, told that uh, there will be three people coming one after the other. So he gave me 10 o'clock time the sec in the morning. <laughs> the second one uh, came at one hour later and the third one another hour later. So th that was uh, like uh, John Faulkner was one of them and uh, when he came to, when I came to see him, uh, I found that he was very informal. And he mentioned a few uh, topics for research, whatever I would like to pick up. And I uh, said, yeah, they're fine, but why don't you give me steady state theory to work on? Mm -hmm. So he said that, uh, that there are certainly many interesting problems in steady state theory, but I, I do not want to keep my student in a controversial position. So I want to give him a topic which is relatively straightforward. That is why he was not giving So I okay, said, okay, I took one of the other problems he had given. And it so happened that within a few months, I solved it. Hmm. So it could not last me for three years, <laughs> no, for graduate thing. So, uh, the, and in the meantime, uh, Ryle, Martin Ryle came up with his um, source counts. And Fred was in a way challenged that the source count was inconsistent with his cosmology. So he asked me to come and work with him to see whether we can salvage the cosmology uh, by some uh, trick. It, it was, so we said, we let us look at it in the following way. And we, we tried uh, a new method and it seemed to work. So he said, you go and uh, you will talk on this at the Royal Astronomical Society. 
So I said, why should I talk to you? Should you are the leader. So he said, no, but at that day I am, I am supposed to lecture somewhere else. So the, somebody has to reply to Ryle. So I want you to do it. So I was a bit scared to take part in a controversy as a, as a raw research student. So finally, uh, this did happen. I managed to uh, convince the audience that there was a case and therefore uh, the uh, purpose was served. And then I, as you see, instead of being avoiding uh, controversial topic, I was put right into in the midst of it. And this was the beginning of the quasi steady state cosmology or had he already started that campaign? Was this the beginning of quasi steady state? Hmm. I don't think so. Oh, the quasi steady state theory came much later. This was when Burbage and uh, Coyle and I, the three of us, we had got a number of times together uh, in uh, uh, the Royal Greenwich Observatory in the UK and in UCSD. So finally, we had suggested a cosmology which is endless. That means it has no beginning, no end. And also uh, it had no singularity. So it was free from space-time singularity and it produced the uh, microwave background uh, without any difficulty which steady state theory had not been able to do. So this quasi steady state theory has had several papers on it in uh, astrophysical journal, astronomy, astrophysics and so on. And uh, we feel that that cosmology needs to be examined uh, under whatever the latest observations are. <clears throat> and that model, quasi-steady state cosmology, featured a new approach that wasn't exactly static. It was evolving very slowly via the presence of a new creation field, a field that you guys called the C field. Whose idea was the C field? Whose idea was C field? The idea of quasi-steady state uh, well, the, the C field itself, the actual creation uh, matter. In particular, C field. C field used in quasi steady state. C, let us see. Okay. You see, the C field was proposed for steady state theory. And we got at that time a very simple solution. Now, when quasi steady state was to be considered, we wanted to put in more uh, kind of what you call parameters. So it became necessary to use the same C field formulation, but with take a more general solution. And that is what we did in QSSC. And that <clears throat> could account for the expansion. I'm sorry, and it, it was, an idea which one cannot really uh, identify as the who was the one among the three. Mm -hmm. We were all involved in throwing the ideas around and discussing. Right. Now, you had earlier worked <clears throat> on what was known as the Hoyle Narlikar theory of gravity. Was that Hoyle Narlikar, was the purpose of that to provide a foundation? for the QSS, for the quasi steady state cosmology, or was it independent of cosmology at all? Your gravitation theory mm -hmm. with Fred, was it connected yeah. with quasi steady state yeah, somehow? Our gravitation theory was in fact the motivator for, for quasi steady state cosmology. So when I said that we wanted to generalize the earlier C field idea. 
that sea field idea was generalized, creation field idea was generalized by taking some ideas out of uh, our uh, gravitation theory. So it's a kind of cross between these two um, cosmos, uh, these two models. Ah, and <clears throat> Hoyle, uh, of course, is very famous because he came up uh, in, with many things, including the Hoyle resonance and, and other properties. But he's perhaps most famous for making the name Big Bang. Uh, do you think that he intended it to stick for 70 years and more? Or do you think he thought it would go away as a, as a joke more, more than anything else? Did he get the idea name Big Bang and did he expect the name to stay or be <laughs> gone? Well, well, Fred always addressed it as the Big Bang. He, he didn't care who, who else uh, got it or uh, used the same word or not. But as you probably know, the Sky and Telescope magazine had. Uh, run a kind of competition for an alternative name. And they came back saying Big Bang is the best. <laughs> yes. And they, so uh... I remember at that time, Fred was saying to me that they should have given him the prize for, for the best name. <laughs> <laughs> was he a person of good humor? Was he lighthearted or was he more serious? Was he lighthearted, more humor, or more serious? More what? Humor. Did he have a sense of humor, or was he more serious? Well, Fred had say, certain ideas in which he would be triggered off in, uh, into a series of laughters if, if he had thought of something happening there. But there, there were limited topics in which he would be humorous. He, otherwise, he was more a kind of serious kind. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the, um, the notion of the, of the going back to quasi steady state cosmology, the C field, some uh, claims have said that it was related to the uh, later discovery of dark energy. How did you react when teams announced in the late 1990s the discovery of an accelerated expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. Connection with dark energy, what do you uh, think? Well, is when you take uh, the quasi steady state cosmology, then uh, the need for dark matter or dark energy uh, dip became different in the following co compared to Big Bang. For the following reason, for example, in the Big Bang cosmology, if you take the early universe, when the, the deuterium was formed, so at that time, how much deuterium you can make depends on what is the maximum uh, uh, density of baryonic matter. If the baryonic matter exceeded a certain limit, no, no deuterium will be formed. So Big Bang needed to uh, exceed that density, but they did not want it to be baryonic. So they said the excess must be an ultra, uh, this, what you call um, dark. without dark. Uh, dark, it is a dark uh, matter of a non-baryonic matter. That is why that came into play. In QSSC, the dark, the dark mass is there, but that is no ordinary matter. It is not uh, uh, the strange kind of non-baryonic dark matter. That is the main difference. <clears throat> and the acceleration, there was acceleration in the QSSC as well. I wonder if um, if you're familiar with ideas now by people like Alan Guth. Certainly, you know about inflation. You've spoken about that. Um, 
what challenge do you think is the most significant challenge to the Big Bang? And then I'm going to ask you, what is the most significant challenge to the quasi steady state cosmology? But first, let's start with the standard cosmological model that so called Big Bang cosmology. What is the biggest flaw, in your opinion, of the Big Bang? And then I'll ask you about the quasi steady state. What is the biggest flaw or the problem before Big Bang? Biggest, biggest flaw, but uh, so something that you don't agree with. Flaw. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest defect of I, I Big think, Bang? Uh, looking back, uh, the microwave background has been the main problem, which uh, on on which Big Bang people have uh, tried to uh, argue that. The uh, uh, non Big Bang cosmologies like uh, uh, QSSC or steady state, old steady state, they were not valid because they could not explain microwave background. Now, our answer to that is that the uh, ex explanation of microwave background in QSSC is quite different and it comes from previous generations of stars, the starlight getting into uh, thermalization process, and it ends up as uh, microwave radiation. So the advantage with our model compared to the Big Bang is that in the Big Bang theory, they don't know what is the ultimate temperature today is. It turned out to be 2.7, but why 2.7? Why not three or five or 10? That question, Barbie used to say that uh, this, uh, our uh, uh, Gamo, he used to give different answers each time he was asked, what is the temperature? So he said five degrees and 10 degrees, 15 degrees, so he, the Burbage was saying that they don't have any theory. Whereas in our case, if we know how much starlight is around, from we can do a calculation and find, show that the temperature is at about 2.8. So we are, in a sense, better than the standard cosmology, but people have not taken it very seriously. Yeah, <clears throat> it is true that the fluctuation of... of that, oh, hey, let me just repeat your question because I think he has answered it in a different way. Yes. His first question was, what is the most important defect of Big Bang? Hmm. Do you think this is the most important defect, problem hmm. or flaw with hmm. Big Bang? Or is there any other? The, uh, what we feel is that both this uh, accelerating universe idea and uh, microwave background, these are kind of put in by hand afterwards. And these uh, uh, people actually don't know why the acceleration is so much and so forth. Whereas in alternative cosmology, in our QSSC, as uh, Barbiz and I had shown in one paper, which we have shown that uh, it is possible to explain the uh, redshift magnitude relation for uh, distant supernovae uh, emitters stars, uh, galaxies, and that has been explained in our theory by saying that there is a background of intergalactic dust which thermalizes and absorbs, which is equivalent to a uh, universe within, which is apparently accelerating. So our idea is that there is an alternative way and the Big Bang method is not very good. Uh, it has been put in by hand. 
Right. So that's interesting. I, I would have thought you might have said the singularity or perhaps the initial creation event, but you seem to say the CMB is the worst aspect of it, uh, which is bad news for me because I study the CMB and its polarization. Um, now I want to ask you if you were um, <clears throat> Gamov or somebody else, what would they say is the biggest problem with the QSSC defect? What would we say the biggest problem with QSSC? Yeah. A uh, critic, uh, someone who's criticizing it. Yeah. You see, uh, what happens is that in the QSSC, the microwave background uh, was not predicted, but is explained afterwards. Whereas in the Big Bang, if you remember, Gamma's students they had written a paper saying that the relic radiation uh, should be around. And this was a prediction. So when something follows after the prediction, you tend to believe it more than something that has been uh, explained after it has been observed. Right. So I would say the, the, the quality wise, the defect is uh, not there. It is quantity-wise, quality-wise. One could say that people uh, could explain uh, the uh, microwave background in QSSC using thermalization of uh, starlight and various other gal galaxy lights, and that thermalization process is a very uh, unusual one, but it is possible. I mean, it is observed in certain part of the uh, galaxy. So we know that that kind of ab absorption is there. So answered his main question. Opponents of QSS, what do the opponents of QSS point out as a defect of QSS? <laughs> Well, and, uh, as I said, they, they would say that uh, both accelerating universe and microwave background, they, those are not explained by steady state, cause right. steady state. <clears throat> My answer is that it is explained and it is given in reputed papers. Would you only you should go and read it. So I wouldn't accept that criticism. Right. Yes, there's the difference between a prediction and a retrodiction. And it's obviously better to have it's better to have a prediction, although many theories were predicted, um, you know, or rather, I should say more, there have been oftentimes people have retrodicted something like Einstein and the perihelion of Mercury. Uh, but but they later turn out to then make new predictions. So um, but do you guys, um, I don't remember if you predicted the acceleration, you, you were trying to come up with an expansion mechanism and that was this creation field or dust. But um, do you think that, <clears throat> do you think that Hoyle who said, once he said, and I quote this in my book in Losing the Nobel Prize, I talk about Hoyle thought that cosmologists were religious, that they believed in the Bible too much that the universe began uh, with Genesis. Did you, th did he mean that seriously in your opinion that the cosmologist of the sixties believed in the Genesis or the biblical uh, creation story? Do you think Hoyle was serious when he said that many cosmologists believe in the genesis of Bible. Was he serious or was he joking? I think he, he was quite serious. Uh, and although he may have said it in a, in a kind of half joking fashion. I, I don't know whether you have seen a photograph of Fred Hoyle being presented to the Pope. No, there was an IAU meeting uh, where this pope was around in Italy, so they arranged this. So when he's uh, talking to 
the, the to the pope he, the pope is holding the cross in his hand it's, <laughs> it's, it looks as if he's he's uh, scared of this and anti-god person <laughs> like a vampire <laughs> no i'll have to look up that picture that would be that very funny to him. Willie, Willie Fowler took that photograph oh wow wow <clears throat> very interesting um so the next we're almost done with the questions but i want to ask you about some alternative models uh, that are different than qssc such as for example this year uh, Sir Roger Penrose won the Nobel Prize for his work on black holes, as, um, as you know, and he's been yeah. on my show very recently too, uh, as well as uh, many others. And, but Martin, um, sorry, uh, going back to Roger Penrose, he has a model which also doesn't have singularities in it. What is your impression of Sir Roger's conformal cyclic cosmology? Well, you are referring to other theories that means not to do with steady state. Yes, cyclical, but not steady. And let me remind him, when Penrose was here in Pune, he at that time, he was talking about his model, which was conformal model. And that, that, did, that also, uh, it was not quasi steady state, but that also explained, it was different from Big Bang. I, I, I also remember. Do you have any opinion on those? Uh, not really, because I, I, I do know some alternative cosmologies exist, which are not of the steady state origin or quasi steady state. But uh, I have not studied them in detail to see to what extent they have succeeded. I, I feel there should be more people studying these things. Yeah, that brings me to one of my last questions is about why is it important to have alternative models of the origin of the universe? Why is that important to have more than one? Uh, we don't have more than one theory of electromagnetism. Why do you want to have more theories? You see, al alternative model you go for if you don't like what is existing, existing at the moment. So there may be different reasons for different people to have, opt, to have opt for uh, this model, these alternatives. I would suggest that uh, the uh, reason has been the Partly the fact that the Big Bang has a singularity, singular origin, which is a defect of a physical theory. And the second thing is, uh, there are many places where uh, the observations are explained by adding extra parameters without realizing. So this uh, also is uh, likely reason for other cosmologists who are non who are non big bang cosmologists for them to have chosen these alternative routes can i can i add just my yes of course Sorry. I, I i study mathematics yes uh, and i have been observing all these people talking about cosmology and different theories and uh, I have come to the conclusion that there is no theory which is completely perfect and can explain all the observations. Mm. If that is the case, why not keep three, four different theories before us and keep studying them and see finally which one will fit best? Why don't we learn from the history? Like Newton's laws I mean, we have been studying them in school for years and they are so perfect and so nice. But even they, when they could not explain the movements of Mercury perfectly, people had kept that problem alive. And when Einstein came with his theory and when that theory explained this better, it was supposed to be better. It was 
in addition to Newton's theory. Maybe in different scales, different theories work more efficiently. Why don't we keep our minds open and consider different theories in case yours is not perfect? That's all. Yes, I agree, Manjal. I think people in physics feel two things. They don't like philosophy, which I don't, uh, I don't understand why physicists don't like philosophy, but they also don't like uh, history. They find it a distraction. They'd rather be doing something. So most of my colleagues uh, would rather just make more and more uh, make, make more and more contributions to kind of existing work. I think it takes a lot of courage, whether or not I agree, I, I look at data and I look at models. I don't come up with new models, but, um, but I do agree with you, Manjal. I think it is incredibly important to have much, many, many ideas and then uh, see which ones can be confronted with data. And then the data, that's my job and my colleague's job with telescopes, and then we compare. Of course, it's always nice when there's a prediction as Giant was saying, but you're right. People don't learn from history, like you say. And I mean, but it's just the extension Newton's of difference. Newton's theory by Einstein is a very good example. You want to say something? No, I, I wanted to say that if you take, uh, I want to give an example that Jeffrey Burvis uh, all through his life was trying to show that there is periodicity in the redshift distribution of quasars. Quasars, yeah. See, and then he, uh, he also talked about various other aspects of non-cosmological redshift. Now, the, the situation since then, that very recently, four Indians have worked on a mo model of statistics to do and do a analysis analysis of the data uh, more critically, and they had taken a, a big sample like a Sloan survey and so forth for red chips, and he showed uh, they have shown that there is a periodicity of redshift. And mind you, this has appeared in astronomy and astrophysics, which is a, ref a refereed journal and which is rather conservative in approach. So even in that thing, the referee uh, accepted the paper and the paper says that the ideas which uh, Hoyle and I had pr proposed uh, in the uh, Markian gravitation theory, mm -hmm. that it does seem to apply uh, to these samples. Mm -hmm. So I think this issue should be kept open rather than uh, say that, yeah. that it doesn't exist or it is not yeah. right. Right. Um, before I turn to the end of the questions, I have some questions for Manjala that you have uh, studied uh, Mangala. Mangala, sorry. So Manga, <laughs> Mangala, right? Yes. Yes, and you studied uh, your mathematician and of course uh, you have been married for a long time and you guys have daughters together, but you've published many, many papers. And uh, in particular, you worked on uh, properties of integers, et cetera, and Erdos, I wonder, did you ever, how, how, can, how close were you to Erdos in terms of, what is your Erdos number? Uh, my Erdos number is two. two uh, in wow. fact, I had, yes, he used to visit. I was working in TIFR, Tata Institute, where Jayant was a professor. Yes. But before I married Jayant, I was a research student there. Yes. And uh, before I could complete my PhD work, I uh, married Jayant and went off to Cambridge, setting up the house, having kids, starting to cook and keep the house. They kept me very much busy. And I, but I took it, took interest in everything. Luckily, when we came back to Mumbai, Jayant got a professorship in TIFR. He chose TIFR as the best place to work. And where he was a professor in another department, I could continue with my study in mathematics again. So mm. after looking after the kids and doing the housework in my spare time, I started going to my old department. <laughs> my supervisor had left. Uh, I must go and open the door and come back. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I'll ask Giant then my question for you. Uh, you wrote many books on science fiction 
in, uh, in particular. What do you prefer, science fiction writing or writing nonfiction books? Sorry. Okay. What do you prefer, writing science fiction or writing nonfiction? Well, I uh, have enjoyed writing science fiction novels. Uh, I have also enjoyed explaining some of these astronomical events to laymen. Both are both require different kind of approach, but they are both uh, I found absorbing. They are well, they are uh, very well received. They are very. And I should tell you, he is a bit shy. Um, I, I should tell you that he has written an autobiography. He wrote it in Marathi in our local language, mm -hmm. and that won him the national award of the wow. literature from Delhi. And he has got it translated in English now. He translated it himself. Wow. That is also good. Out. And he has been writing very well. Uh, uh, now, now about my career again. Yes. So my, my career was looking after the house and kids. Jayan's parents were also, they moved in with us. I had to look after them also. And in my spare time, I started working in mathematics. <clears throat> my supervisor had left, he had gone to Europe. But I started with the new research students again after six years they had joined. And I found, I changed my field a little bit from analytic geometry, I shifted to analytic number theory. And I managed to solve a problem and get a PhD. That was the advantage I had because Jayan took a job in TIFR. <laughs> <laughs> Because if you're not traveling in Bombay, it is so difficult that if I had to travel for one hour to go to the place of work, I simply could not have done it. <laughs> I had hardly two hours every day. Wow. And, but my, the other staff was very cooperative. They, they used to have the lectures when I had time to attend. That was nice. Oh, wow. That's very nice. And you've, but you've now, also... Yeah, now I'm a teacher of mathematics and I'm working for school children. Mm. I have supervised the textbooks in my state and they are received well. Oh, wow. Now, some of your children, your daughters have become scientists as well. Uh, yes. what, but they didn't, they didn't take after either one of you. They, were, they went into different fields of biology and chemistry, right? They, they are very good with basic maths. In our house, it has to be. Yes. And uh, the oldest mm. one, she is a professor of biochemistry in UCSF. Oh, good. She's been. She is Geeta Nalika. She has her own uh, lab and her, her students are also progressing. The second one did computer science. She did PhD from uh, Carnegie Mellon. She is now working for Google, Girija. Mm -hmm. That is Girija Nalika. And none of them changed their names after marriage <laughs> as normally Indian women do. They do. <laughs> Third one is Leelawati Nalika. And she decided to... Um, Combine both the fields. She works in computer science, but she does applications of computer science to biology. Ah, very interesting. So, but but they chose their fields. We, yeah. we of course. Did. But basic knowledge of mathematics, yes, they must have. They must know that, and they probably came here to San Diego maybe to visit when when Giant was here. I remember many times you guys, or at least Giant. I remember many times you were here, and I hope. You'll be able to come back someday because we miss you and and you're certainly a legend in the field of cosmology. And I remember how happy Jeff would be whenever you'd come to visit. And um, and even our, our assistant, uh, Peggy McCoy, she sends regards to you uh, as well because uh, she, she worked very and closely. I, I, you will visit Pune sometime and visit the institute that Jayant was the director and founder of. I would love to. I've never been to India at all. But that brings me to my final question, which is for both of you. I want you each to answer separately. What would advice would you give to your younger self? And I'm going to phrase it. The name of this podcast is called Into the Impossible. It's based on Sir Arthur C. Clarke. And he said the only way to find out what's possible is to go beyond into the impossible. And I want to ask Giant first, and then Mangala, I want to ask you too. What thing about life seemed very scary when you were very young, a 20 year old person? What scared you, but then you had courage and you went into the impossible? So Giant, you first, you have a lot of courage. 
when uh, my advice to the students would be uh, to need... to be honest with his, with what they like sometimes they are made to do research in an area in which there is a bandwagon effect that they have to do it uh, otherwise but they are not really convinced that is correct so the, you should be convinced that you are along a worthwhile path that is my thing and what about you mangal i think the scientists are and should be the seekers of the truth irrespective of all other things and to find the truth yeah as jain says you have to be brave you don't have to uh, follow the line unless you are convinced but main thing is the truth stands above all of us so leave alone all the personal things and try to get what is the correct thing what is the best thing don't be afraid of the truth i i don't know whether you read the story about fred when he was in primary school no. see the class miss the teacher asked them to go and collect a certain type of flower and she claimed that each flower has five mm -hmm. petals clover clover flower which you always yeah. find in the grass yes so the you go bring it and you will see it so they brought each uh, class uh, the whole class brought things uh, like that now the one with jeff brought no, and not fred brought was that it showed uh, uh, six petals it had the flower uh, had six petals. six petals so he asked uh, the teacher you said there are five i can and believe they can be four if one is fallen off but why how can i have six petals and the teacher got very annoyed with this questioning and she uh, boxed his ear <laughs> and he went home right away he did not want to stay in the school and then he complained uh, his, his mother was in favor of him which when she heard all the details and then uh, it, it went on until the headmaster said that fred can it was he didn't want to go into that say school again so they said he can change the school and they will arrange that so this was an example of fred not liking the conventional wisdom <laughs> and was, reacting to authority something unusual yeah and he, he was he, showing evidence yeah he uh, he certainly had uh, his is uh, his challenge to authority he was not one to to go along with the geese the flock of geese that i've heard you talk about uh, before anyway i thought i would only get one dr narlikar and i got two it's a bonus prize angala thank you so much jayan thank you so much This is such a lovely treat for me. It's an honor to to meet you both or to see you both. I do hope that you have a wonderful new year, healthy and happy, and I do hope that we meet to get meet someday in person either in California or maybe in Pune. That would be wonderful for me too. That would be nice. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Good night. Thanks for going into the impossible with me. Good night guys. Our good